COVID-19 has changed the world. I'm interviewing extraordinary people on the front line, stepping up with amazing acts of kindness in the fight against this virus. Tune in to watch, support and share their inspiring stories because together we are stronger. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, and I know you've just finished a night shift. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, so um, well, my regular day gig is I'm actually a consultant anaesthetist. Um, so I'm mainly involved in uh, patients having surgery and giving the anaesthetics. However, in what's going on at the moment, I'm essentially functioning as an intensive care doctor. So, um, so because all sort of um, surgery is sort of stopped, essentially, unless you've got emergency life or limb threatening surgery, which we are carrying on with, um, we are now basically all working in intensive care with all the sick um, patients coming in with COVID-19. So you're actually um, in, in a COVID-19 intensive care unit? Yes, that's what I'm doing all the time now, <laughs> essentially. That's what every single patient's got. And, um, and, and so, I, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, I was going to say, so my actual role is essentially, um, as, as an anaesthetist, I have the skills to be able to put, uh, can perform the, what's called the intubation, which is where you put the breathing tube into the airway. Um, and that's when the patients are struggling and they need to go to intensive care, they need to be put on a ventilator. So we put them on the ventilator, we then take them to intensive care and we look after them for however long they're in intensive care. And that's basically my job. And, and how many people you sort of see, how many people are going through the intensive care at the moment? Because I know we keep, we keep hearing figures are changing, obviously the, the death I mean, rates it, and recovery rates. I mean, it absolutely, it varies. It varies a lot. Um, our, my hospital, it's hard to say, like, say exactly what's happening in all the other hospitals. I can only comment on my hospital. And my hospital is in East London and we are pretty busy and we're one of the busier hospitals within our trust, our hospital trust. Um, I think we've seen about, I mean, I would say around 50 patients um, have come into our intensive care. Um, I'd say probably got around 25 at the moment. These numbers aren't probably accurate, but they're kind of ballpark. Um, and the thing that I thought that some people might be really interested in, because I think, you know, there's a lot of information in the news about how, like, we don't have enough ventilators. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, there is that, but there's also, we don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough, lots of things. It's not just about ventilators. And it's not, and just because you end up on a ventilator doesn't mean you're going to, that's going to be it and you're going to survive. So a really sort of startling statistic is, you know, if you do end up on a ventilator, you've got a 50-50 chance. Wow, 50-50 chance. Um, um, and what are the sort of people that, um, that are surviving? Um, you know, what we're hearing that it's, it's, it's the elderly that are at most risk, but as I understand it, you're not even taking the elderly into the, to the, to that stage. Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of depends. I mean, some people might be insulted that we classify someone who's above 60 as elderly. So that in itself is like, well, actually, a lot of those people are still working. They're not yeah, even retired absolutely. yet. Um, so in my, in my head, I thought, I think we, I would classify elderly as sort of 70 and above. Now, we, we don't have a strict thing about age per se, but we, we do have a criteria that's looking at how likely we think you're going to survive and we do only have a limited number of ventilators so we can't take everyone to intensive care that maybe in the past we might have done mm -hmm. um so anybody that's classified as frail there's this thing called the clinical frailty score and um if you don't if you are not uh considered to be uh if you're considered to be frail based on that scoring system then you don't actually uh you're not currently being allowed to come to ITU with a, for a ventilator and then it's either you survive on the ward just by you turn the corner on your own or you don't and you die. Wow that's quite something we're playing sort of god almost by yeah I guess selecting and I, I you know I'm not making a right or wrong it's you know you, you you're all doing a fantastic job but it's 
it must be very difficult and and you must be going through some emotions emotional you know you're going through this and you're tired do you, how are you feeling right now mel i am uh i am tired i am and it's not a physical tiredness i mean i am working a lot more hours a lot more intensively so the work is more physically taxing but that's not what is hard i think that um it is emotionally very draining very taxing um, and I knew it was going to be hard. I don't think I knew it was going to be as hard as it actually is. And um, how I've tried to describe it is, uh, I don't know if you've heard, if you've been hearing a lot about PPE, which is that uh, equipment. equipment. So basically because the specialty I am in is considered high risk and we are far more likely to be exposed to high amounts of COVID from the patients because you're, you're essentially leaning over the patient, putting a breathing tube in and you know, you're getting like facefuls of the virus. Yes. So um, we absolutely need to have the PPE. And I am very fortunate in my hospital that we do currently have enough P PPE for us at least, for the people doing that. Um, but the PPE itself is personally, uh, is quite an ordeal because it's a very tight fitting mask. Yeah. Um, there's a visor and then you've got a gown on three sets of gloves on three sets, wow. three sets well for, for the procedure of putting the breathing tube and you need three sets of gloves on and uh and something covering all of your basically your body so that you know hopefully you're not going to ca carry all of that uh virus on you once you leave so essentially it's like working in a sauna or a sweat lodge it's very hot, very sweaty. You feel like you can't breathe because you've got this very tight mask on. And then you've got three sets of gloves on so you can't feel your fingers. So you're trying to do your normal tasks, but with less. Um, so everything is harder, basically. And it's, yeah, it's hard. And, um, and what you're seeing and, yeah, it's that kind of diversity of, like, you see what you're seeing in the hospital and then you come out and you see people who are still not listen, taking it seriously, not you know following social distancing, and and if you like, do you understand what this means? In a couple of weeks, that could be you, that we're having to, and if we don't have enough ventilators, then what? So I feel really like I feel anger, I feel angry a lot of the time. Who do you feel angry at? I mean, is the government doing the right thing? The government. Uh, um, I think the government may may have been a bit slow on the slow to take it up, but I think they are doing absolutely the right thing. I think they're doing, uh, and maybe maybe they need to be even stricter. I'm not sure, but I just know that that what they're suggesting all are the right things. But the thing is, there is this reliance on trusting people to follow the rules and do the right thing. And I do think the majority are. I know my friends are very much taking it seriously and seem to be doing, you know, following the rules and the guidelines and everything. But I also, I, when I drive to work and drive back, I can see people that are not. And it, I just get so angry because I, it, maybe they'll be okay. Maybe they won't get it. But do they understand that they could potentially pass it on to somebody else who won't be as fortunate? They will die. Um, is there anything in it, you know, where we're all told if you're fit and healthy or we're sort of led to believe if we're fit and healthy, um, you know, even if we get it, we should, we should be fine. Uh, is that the truth? Is that the truth and reality of the situation? That's not entirely accurate. And I think that has been actually one of the biggest issues with um, how it was originally, you know, how it was originally sort of sold to us as that it was a, a flu and that, you know, unless you're elderly or got pre-existing yeah. conditions, you'll be fine. And I'm not at all in any way trying to add to hysteria or panic mm -hmm. because I don't think that serves anybody. But it's not accurate. And the patients I'm seeing are not people you would consider to be uh, people that... So one of the things I saw, one of the news reports I saw said something like, the people that are dying are the people that would have died anyway in the next year from their other conditions. Yes. That I yes, can actually I, I tell you from first hand well. experience. That is not true. Um, the people who are, I've seen dying are people that were not going to die in the next year, not going to die in the next five years. 
not, probably not even the next 10, they could have just had a bit of mild high blood pressure and just be on blood pressure tablets or diabetes that's well controlled. These were functional members of society. And we've had people, I think the youngest people we've potentially had in our hospital was in their 20s. Wow. So, and again, no pre-existing medical conditions. So it's not true to say uh, you only have to worry about this if you're elderly. It's something everybody should be worried about. We've also had children come in and we've had children as young as a few hours old to a few, you know, a few months old and they've ended up on ventilators. A few Our hospital, hours old. Wow. Yeah. I think, I'm guessing their mother must have been infected and they must have contracted it the minute they were born. Um, I don't know if you can pass it on through pregnancy. I think it must be at, at birth. I'm not okay. quite sure. Um, but we, our hospital isn't set up for that. So basically we end up putting them on ventilators and they get transferred out to a different hospital. So, yeah. So it, in general, thankfully, children don't seem to die. Even if they get it severely, it's very, it's very uncommon that they won't survive so i think children are more likely to get milder versions or no symptoms but they can definitely be carriers absolutely um and is there anything is there anything that you would like to advise you know people that are watching this to do is is there any um, cautions i mean other than obviously what the government is telling us to do um i think i think if you do stick to that to seriously minimize um your your sort of contact and i think they say you know stay a, at least two meters away from other people that you're not sharing a sort of living space with um there is now this discussion about whether or not people should go out wearing face masks um e you know even just general the general public um to the supermarket or wherever you're going and i think there's been some arguments that in asia that the some of the countries potentially have reduced their uh, numbers because in general, just as a normal thing, if you don't feel well, you wear a mask. Yeah. If, any, if, any, if you're not sure, you could wear a mask. It's commonplace in Asia to, to see people with, with face masks on and obviously it isn't exactly. here in London. So there has been some discussion about whether that might be part of the reason that their numbers aren't, aren't as bad as ours. So there is talk about, there isn't convincing evidence as yet and also, the one thing we, uh, that they've been stressing is you shouldn't be falsely reassured by wearing a mask because even if you're wearing a mask, you're not protecting your eyes and your eyes are a route to still get the infection. So short of wearing a mask and then a visor, you're not protected. Plus, you're still touching things with your hands. So all it has to be is on your hands for a bit and then when you take the mask off, yes, you're you contaminated your hands anyway. Yeah. Plus, you're, take, you're touching your face to take the mask off. So it, it can give people false reassurance. But, you know, just really kind of adhering to the sort of minimizing touching your face, which is very hard to do. I, I find it very hard not to touch my face. Um, you know, washing your hands or, and just maintaining the social distancing. So, yeah, absolutely. I can't think of anything else that you can really do. Can it get big clothes? Thing. I mean, I heard what, you know, I had I heard things that you, you should wash your clothes as well. Um, I think there is there is thoughts that actually it can um, it can stick on your clothes for a while. So absolutely, you know, you can you should wash your clothes frequently. But there's also, you know, thoughts about, you know, when you buy the food, if it's been handled by anybody else, you should wipe it down or wash it. So, but yeah, I'd assume that most people would do that anyway, to be honest. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, yeah, it's just, there is this thing about it can linger on surfaces. So do wipe your surfaces down. Now, if nobody in your household is showing any signs, then you're probably all right and you're sticking to those rules. You probably don't need to be as, but the, every time you go out, you are potentially putting yourself at risk, particularly if you're using any sort of public transport, if you're using the bus mm. or the tube, because you could be holding on to, you know, the, the handle that yeah. someone else. So it's any time you're opening a door that someone else has opened you could be touching something that someone else who's it can has has it has touched so it's very much like once you're out of the house you are potentially exposing yourself but you know 
and the, and the weather's the weather's about to get warmer and um you know that that's going to encourage people obviously to get out of the house there there it's it's going to be one of those things and in a lot of respects we were blessed with the cold weather because people want to stay indoors more um are there any real initial signs that we can look out for um it's very variable that's i i i know many people that have had it because it most of the people at work are going dropping like flies you know so they're going off sick getting it recovering and then coming back to work so it's all very different for different people some people it presents very much like a tonsillitis so they start with a sore throat um, and then fevers and cough some people it's a, a sore fever or mild fever some people it's a dry cough uh, some people some people have been saying oh you know if you get a runny nose it's not that but actually for some people it does present with a runny nose for some people they do get almost like a sort of a diarrhea sort of gastrointestinal upset with diarrhea and vomiting so it's really non-specific that's why it could look like a cold it could look like flu it could look like food poisoning yeah. Head, common things seem to be things like headaches Headache. Lots of people complain of headaches, muscle aches. So and um, all these things, and I've had one of those in the last few days, definitely. <laughs> but of course, I, I, I've, I've had a headache. I kid you not. And I wake up every morning thinking, "This is it." I've this. I've because I've had headaches and all sorts, but I'm sure it's because I'm dehydrated. And, and, will they test you for it, Mel? I mean, how are they looking after you know the, the nurses and doctors? I've seen a lot in the news about how they should be testing us on the front line mm. and I do think it's a good idea because you know if we've definitely had it or we're carrying it it would be very useful to know yeah um, well, if you've had it you can't catch it again right you, you you're safe then well um, I, I don't know this is a it's a question that, that, that there's a lot of discussion about that we're not entirely clear the issue is you'll you'll potentially be immune to the version that you had Okay. However, this is quite a sneaky virus and it has, it has the ability to mutate. So the problem is you could be immune to one version and then being reinfected with a different version. Now, I've so, never, I haven't heard that before. That, that's, that's, quite, that's interesting. I've not heard that there's, there's various different mutations and you can catch it more than once. Yes. I mean, I know, I already knew, I don't know how many versions there are and I'm not up to date with that, but I definitely know there's at least two. And they thought that the version that was in China is slightly different to the version that's in Italy. And that the version in Italy was actually worse. And I think the one that we, I think the one that's mainly going around in this country is probably an offshoot of the one from Italy. Because I yeah. think it was more when the Italian went to Italy and came. Right. So I know there's at least two versions. So you might be, let's say, immune to the Italian version, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're immune to the Chinese China. version. Chinese version. So it, it's not it's not that clear. Uh, I don't. I think you're put it this way. You'd at least have partial immunity, so you shouldn't necessarily get like a whole. Maybe in the same way that most of us don't get terrible flus because we've got a partial immunity to most flus, and it's only a very unusual flu that then gets us really badly. It's a similar thing that we would would have a partial immunity to most of the coronavirus, but maybe not a complete. So we could potentially get reinfected. So, yeah, it's not as clear cut as we'd want. And as, as I understand it, some people are just immune, full stop, they're, they're born with, that they do have the immunity. Um, we, we don't know. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Some people just won't get it, irrespective if they're around it. They'll just not get it. But we, there's no way to predict who those people are. And Mel, I mean, what, what are your biggest challenges at the moment? Um, you're, you're, you've just come off a, a night shift. What sort of shifts are you working? So this week I'm doing nights. So I'm doing um, 8 p.m. at night till 8 in the morning. I mean, that's your basic hours, but it's rare that you finish on time. So it's more, um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, the workload is very intense. So back in the day, you know, I used to do 24 hour shifts uh, prior to this. Like originally I was doing 24 hour shifts when this hit, but we realized quite quickly that it, it's too much work. You, it's too intense you can't actually it kills you to do a 24-hour shift so that's why we've dropped down to a 24-hour shift um from, drop down from a 24-hour shift to a 12-hour shift so 
but even that that you know it's it's go 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 there's very little uh time to rest or you know necessarily go to the restroom eat drink um it's hard to take care of yourself um it's very high stress um i mean i am in what i will say is the people that are currently i'm working with they're incredible we've all been asked to step out of our comfort zones and do things that we are not trained to do ever expected to do and honestly if you told me that two months ago that this is what people be asked to do and would they do it i would have laughed and said absolutely not but everyone almost without complaint is going facing their fears stepping up and working and I've never seen the NHS function as well as it is right now. And in terms of helping each other, the morale, supporting each other, and kind of just trying to look after each other. So that has been incredible, the, the morale and the support. Equally, I think a lot of people are at risk of burnout. Yeah, um, of course, of course. It's taking quite an emotional toll that we're just pushing through right now but I think it will have quite um, significant knock-on effects uh, later down the line, hopefully, when this is all over. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a difficult time. How are you managing? How are you supporting you, yourself? Have you got people around you? Are you, are you getting food when you get in from a shift? Um, yeah, so I am definitely avoiding the shops because I, I think I'm highly likely to be carrying coronavirus. Mm. So I don't even want to risk going into a shop and who knows, just walking past someone and potentially giving it to them. I've got no symptoms and I don't feel ill, but mm. I think I've been so exposed to the virus. I'd be amazed if I don't haven't either had it, I'm a silent carrier, or I've got it right now, I just don't know. So, so obviously my fridge is slowly but surely emptying out. Um, I am lucky that uh, actually a lot of food is being provided at work. Um, I think lots of people are doing sort of charitable things where they're providing food for frontline workers. I have interviewed and I, a few of them actually and, and doing amazing, you know, converting their kitchens and, but even yeah. that, you know, the, the, unfortunately they're running, running out of space because of the social distancing rules. It means they can't take any more volunteers in. Um, so yeah. it's becoming dangerous in itself. So, well, not dangerous, but it's becoming potentially a, a breeding ground. So, yeah, no, I mean, I'm very lucky that in my hospital, um, they've opened our canteen pretty much 24 seven. There are a few little shops where you can buy a snack if you need to. And also there's been these amazing volunteers that have been delivering hot meals for frontline workers yeah. and I'm basically making the most of that because actually I don't I could go to a shop um but I don't want to that's so um I don't I don't want to be responsible for in any way propagating this virus um my support system in terms of um being at home I'm I live on my own so in in that is Positives and negatives. Positives are that I don't have any worries that I'm going to bring this virus home and infect anybody else. Yes. Um, negatives are, I guess, there's a lot of time to then come home and dwell and there's a lot of quiet time, which I need, but equally it means I can spend a lot of time sort of thinking about the things I'm seeing and experiencing. So I'm leaning quite heavily via, um, you know, FaceTime and that sort of stuff with my friends who have mm -hmm. all been incredible. Um, I... I have parents that I spend a lot of time worrying about who live in North, I live, I live in South East London, they live in North West London. Um, and I'm just, I'm like a, I feel like I'm the parent because I feel like all I do is sort of ring, ring them and shout at them and say, don't go out, don't go out because they are, el they are elderly and at the risk, they're at the at risk population basically. And um, I feel like they're somewhat like teenagers and not thinking about consequences and thinking we'll be all right. Uh, so I'm constantly saying, don't go out, don't go out. It's, you know, you don't want to get this. Uh, so they, I worry about them a lot. Um, and obviously I can't visit them until this is over. Um, yeah, I think it, the leaning on, I think, you know, we've got a lot of cam camaraderie at work and only the people at work necessarily really understand what, what it is that we're going through. And 
initially when I was first starting to go through this, I felt very isolated. I felt like what we're dealing with in the hospitals, the rest of the world, this was before lockdown and everything. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the rest of the world weren't appreciating and supporting us and what we were having to do. I it doesn't feel like that now. It feels like the rest of the world. Yeah. I think we were all in denial. To be honest, when I first started hearing about it in China, I was in denial. I was like, well, it's a flu, you know. And, you know, the truth is 80% of you will be absolutely fine. It's just, are you a gambling person? Are you going to be absolutely certain that you're going to be in the 80% that are fine? And what if you're not? Or what if it's someone that you love that's not? Do you know what I mean? That's the thing. Do, do you see this getting better? Have you seen things getting better? Or, um, I mean, what, what are your views of, of the future? Well, that's, that's a real challenge for me because the, the, you know, there's no imminent sign that it's getting better. I mean, we all, we've all heard about flattening the curve and all this sort of stuff, but there's a lot of debate about how long will this be? How long will look like it be this bad before it gets better? Um, and it was funny because I used to work at the Royal London, which is the trauma center in London. And I used to mentally sort of think, what, what would I be able to handle and what wouldn't I be able to handle? And I always thought that one day, like I would face some sort of big challenge. But in my head, I always thought it'd be something like a terrorist attack because the Royal London dealt with 7-7, the Royal London dealt with the London Bridge attacks. So I'd always, I'd in my head, mentally rehearsed what would happen if something like that happened to me? Would I be able to handle it? What would, what would be expected? In my head, I'd never rehearsed what would happen if a pandemic hit and that the pandemic would be primarily breathing disorder which is where we come in because that's where suddenly we are very key workers yes. versus some of the other things where maybe surgeons would be more important yeah. or other specialties um so that I, I wasn't prepared for that and the thing about this one is even with a terrorist attack you think it's going to be terrible for a few days a week maybe even a couple of weeks but then it's done with this you know there's talk of could this be months and the idea of sustaining this level of stress um, workload for months is really so i try not to think about that i try not to think about when because I don't know. And sometimes I can, it can be very overwhelming, the thought that it could be for a long time. Um, my hope is that it's not. And there has been lots of mentioning that we think we might be hitting the peak in the next two weeks. But we're already very stretched. So even just the thought of hitting the peak in the next two weeks is how we're going to handle that. So, you know, I mean, we're running out of everything. I mean, including oxygen. And you need oxygen to give to the patients. Mel, is there anything anyone can do that's listening to this? Um, you know, uh, everyone I know that I've spoken to, and um, certainly I think the general feeling um, in 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 England, uh, in in the UK, is very much you know what an amazing, um, absolute amazing things that the NHS are doing, and thank God for the NHS. And if, there, if there's any time we, 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 we feel like we haven't appreciated it, now is the time that, you know, unsung heroes, absolutely. But is there anything practically or that we can actually do um, from a practical standpoint, whether that's a don donations, um, going to volunteer to, to get food out to you? So um, how I look at it is there's a few things that, Few, few suggestions um one thing i would say is like i really do appreciate everyone that's acknowledged me and thanked me because you know every day i have to remind myself why am i doing this and um and i know what i'm doing i know obviously i'm trying to help as many people as we can and get as many people through this as possible uh but it really does make a difference when people acknowledge you thank you kind of understand that what you're doing is above and beyond Completely. because i don't know if i'm going to you know, live through this. We don't know. We know that healthcare workers are getting sick and dying and you have no idea. And even if I don't get it, how will I know that everybody I'm working so closely with, will we all be standing at the end of this? And that's a real worry. So the thanks that, you know, when the applause happens on those Thursday evenings, it yeah. really does, really does lift our spirits. It, you, you think, you know, 
yeah, it really makes a difference. So just stuff like that does help. And I have very much appreciated the people that have cooked food and delivered it to the front line. I very much appreciated that. Uh, what I will say is that, you know, none of that is absolutely essential. The, the ways, and maybe this is very selfish, the ways are to look after yourselves, don't get sick, so that you can reduce my workload. Don't, even if, even if you don't get COVID, you know, if you are doing sort of reckless things where you're going to break a bone or, you know, fall down the yeah. stairs. Taking the resources away. Yeah, if you're going to end up having to come into hospital for anything, that increases our workload. And, you know, some things you can't help. You can't help if you develop appendicitis. You can't help if, um, if you know, you have a heart attack necessarily. Yeah. But yeah. there are certain practices, high-risk practices, that if you're not taking care of your health, you're going to end up in the hospital and drain our resources even more than they are. So looking, taking exceptional care of yourself being as healthy as you can, maybe you know, eating healthy, all the things that we say normally, do yeah. it now, if you're yeah. ever going to do it. Um, so that's one thing, is really looking after yourselves. Uh, the other thing is, I very much want everyone to be in a good state at the end of this. And I am conscious that at least one thing I can say is, I still have a job and I am still being paid. So I, want, I don't want anyone to lose their, the roof over their heads or be starving because of their financial situations. So if anything, I would say, make sure nobody in your community is going hungry. Because, you know, that, you know, I mean, if, you're not, if they're not taking care of themselves and they're not nutritionally well, they're gonna end up in hospital as well. So, Although you know, this is a social distancing disease, there is something to be said that it's, it's brought communities together. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, sure I'm that is beautiful. various different communities and, you know, we're all emailing and saying, is such and such okay? Or people are saying, oh, I can't get out to the shops and people are still yeah. leaving food on the doorstep. So I do feel there is a sense of community that, that has come of this. And, and that is, and I think that's something that we really needed. And, and you know, if we're going to look for positives and gifts out of this, the fact that you really do feel a sense of sort of community connection and that we're responsible for each other. So that, you know, to know that like, whatever you're doing, even, you know, what they were doing for our local hospital is, you know, supporting the local businesses that are providing the food and then the, the businesses were giving us the food. So, you know, just keeping the businesses going so that we're not all in an absolute state at the end of this. Um, thoughts, prayers, positive energy, any of that stuff. I'm a big fan of any of that yeah, because, you know, praying for this to be over with as soon as possible, that would be great. Um, and then I think what, there was one more thing I thought that would make a difference. I think once this, pray, I pray that this is done very soon. And once it is done, I just really hope that people don't have short memories. You know, like that the minute, oh, thank God it's all done, let's go back to normal. And then suddenly we're not appreciating the dustbin workers and the people keeping the supermarkets open and the people providing the food and the nurses and the doctors and the people That's driving the buses. Like, let's remember who kept civilization going while we had to shut down and who put themselves at risk. So I just really hope there's not going to be a short memory afterwards. Well, that's a beautiful way to end this interview. Um, a great lesson learned um, to keep up, you know, the, the community spirit and to the people that are providing amazing services. But Honestly, Mel, I, I, you know, I, I want to say thank you. You've been moving me to tears. And when I first spoke to you before this interview, I, I knew I just wanted to shine a light on your story. Um, and I just want to say thank you. I know millions out there and our country is, thank, you know, hats off to you. You're doing thank, an absolutely you. fantastic job. Please thank you. And I, appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to just sort of share what's going on. So thank you so much. And thank you for sharing. Please say stay safe. I'll do my best. <laughs> Namaste. Thank you. Bless you. Namaste. Thank you.